Hey, hi, it's the 15th of May, 2018. This is the latest in a series of little talks that we're doing under the heading Timothy Snyder Speaks. What I'd like to talk about today are ideas, the ideas of the politics of inevitability and the politics of eternity. These are the ideas that I use at the end of On Tyranny and then at the beginning of Road to Unfreedom to try to describe where we're coming from mentally, politically, ethically, and where we're going. So what I thought I'd do today is take a breath and try to explain what these ideas are. Let me just start with the basic claim that ideas matter and that they matter a lot. If you don't think ideas matter, well, that's also an idea. The idea that ideas don't matter is also an idea, and it matters to you. I'm going to venture to say that the idea that ideas don't matter is a bad idea. In fact, it's an idea which suggests that you're under the spell of this thing that I'm going to call the politics of inevitability, or that you're under the spell of the thing which I'm going to call the politics of eternity. Now, these ideas, inevitability and eternity, are very tempting because what they do is they allow us to move forward through time without really thinking too much. What the politics of inevitability says is that we know the rules of history. One thing leads to another. There's going to be progress. And this is a very tempting idea because it suggests that what you do or what I do doesn't matter too much. We don't have to really look too hard at what's going on around us. We don't have to make difficult choices because things are going to flow the way they're going to flow and they're flowing in the right direction. So in the U.S., the politics of, of, of inevitability have looked something like this. We say history is over after 1989. There are no alternatives. Capitalism is going to lead to democracy. Everything is going to be fine. And we spend 25 years saying things like this, and we educate a whole generation in those ideas. Now, that's an idea. And because it's an idea, it then tends to influence what we actually do and it tends to bring about situations which eventually make the idea impossible to sustain. So at different points for different people in different parts of the country, this idea of progress, this idea that we know the rules, that everything's going to get better, starts to come unhinged. Time starts to seem like it's out of joint. And this, I think, is why the present moment is not only threatening, it's, it's weird, it's uncanny. Because it's not just that things that we didn't expect are happening, it's that our whole sense that things are automatically going to get better has been challenged or undermined or, or overthrown. Let's look at a couple of ways that this has happened. So one part of the American politics of eternity says that capitalism leads to democracy. Okay, sure. But if you think that, that means that you don't then intervene in capitalism with the kinds of policies that you would need to make sure that there is economic and racial equality. If you don't have those kinds of policies, then you're not going to have social advancement. You're not going to have a sense among parts of the population that they can join into this story of the future. And of course, people are right to doubt that. If you were born in the U.S. in 1940, your chances of doing better than your parents economically were about 9 in 10. If you were born in 1980, your chances of doing better than your parents were about one in two. From 1980 to the present, in inequalities of wealth and income have only gotten worse. So people are right to think that the future doesn't automatically hold something better for them. And so this idea of inevitability starts to crack and it starts to break. Another example is technology. Um, I'll talk about this in another segment, but we, we had the idea, again, beginning in the early 1990s, that the internet could only bring enlightenment. That is simply not proven to be the case. The internet has rather tended to bring, not always, but it's tended to bring stupefaction. Um, the internet is the thing which, for example, brought us the current president of the United States. Again, I'll talk about this more in other places. But one thing we can say for sure is that technology has not automatically proven to be enlightening. It can be divisive and it can make people less educated, even as they think they're more educated. A third example is globalization. So in the American politics of, of, etern of, of inevitability, the idea was that America is a democracy. There are no alternatives to democracy after 1989, after the end of communism. 
everyone is going to become more like the United States. In fact, the opposite has happened. Um, in, the last, in, the, in the last decade or more, what's happened is that countries have moved away from democracy towards authoritarianism, including our own, and no one, and I mean no one, looks at the U.S. as a model of democracy. The U.S. has become less democratic, and enemies around the world, in particular the Russian Federation, see the problems of our democracy as a way to make things worse. So the larger point here is that the politics of inevitability is, is a bad idea for a couple of reasons. The first is that it dulls our sensibility, it dulls our sense of responsibility. It means it, it tells us that we don't really have to be citizens, we don't have to look around, we don't have to think, because everything's going in the right direction. The second, re the second reason why it's a bad idea is that it eventually breaks. And when it breaks, we then feel lost, we feel vulnerable. We, we don't know quite what to do because it turns out there aren't any rules. And so what we tend to do is we tend to shift to this other idea. The idea that in the books I call the politics of eternity. So what's the politics of eternity? In the politics of eternity, there is no future. So you stop believing that the future is automatically going to be better and you forget about the future entirely. Instead, you're lulled into a different sense of time where things were better in the past, where America was a good place in the 1930s, 40s, or 50s, say, and all that has to happen is we have to make America great again. We have to loop back to some kind of a past. Um, you stop thinking about the future. You think that the only problem is the past. And then you think, well, why isn't America today like it was back in the good old days? And the answer is, well, because we have enemies. Those enemies who are abroad, those enemies who are at home, the immigrants, the Muslims, the Chinese, the Jews, the blacks, whatever it might be. But these people abroad or at home who have taken away those things that we used to have. And so politics then stops being about what we might all do together for a future and starts being about a kind of eternal present where People have, some people have a vision of the past where everything was great, other people can't agree with that, and you get into a politics of us and them, which it really takes place in an eternal present. If you like this sort of thing, you're going to be nostalgic. You're going to go for this big loop. You're going to think about making America great again, for example. You're going to think the slogan, America First, makes sense. If you don't like it, you're going to get hit by a different loop, which is the loop of the daily news cycle, the loop of the daily tweet the loop where you're so outraged or incensed by what happens at a given moment that you can't think about the future either. Either way, everybody's trapped in a politics of eternity. Now, the dangers of the politics of eternity are that, first of all, like the politics of inevitability, nobody has any responsibility, right? In the politics of inevitability, nobody has any responsibility because we all think everything's gonna be fine no matter what we do. In the politics of eternity, Nobody has any responsibility because we think things are going to be bad and conflictual no matter what we do. So the politics of eternity is, is attractive precisely because it allows you to move from optimism to pessimism, um, from a sense of hope to a sense of despair, whatever it might be, without ever taking responsibility yourself. But the other reason, maybe more fundamental, why the politics of eternity is threatening is that it allows leaders, governments, to govern from a position of economic and also racial inequality. If everyone accepts the politics of eternity, if people are thinking not about the future but about the past, if everyone is caught in these various loops, loops of decades or loops of the daily news cycle, that means that government no longer has to promise policy. Government no longer has to talk about the future. Government then just becomes a kind of arbiter in the struggle between us and them, defining external enemies and defining internal enemies. And people forget to ask the government for policy. What that means in the long run is that you can govern from a position of extreme inequality, right? No one's going to challenge that. You're going to forget that the whole point of government was to give everyone a chance. So that's, that's the issue. Now, how do we get out of this? I hope that I've described this well enough, if not here, then in the books, that you can feel or sense how all of us, or many of us, I think most of us, are, have shifted at one point or another from this idea of inevitability to this idea of eternity. How can we stop this? Um, this is what I mean when I call the book The Road to Unfreedom, that you know, the road to unfreedom is from inevitability to eternity. How do you stop that or how do you exit? How do you get off this road to unfreedom? The answer is, is history. This is why I wrote The Road to Unfreedom as a history book, even though it's about the present. What history does 
is it allows us to break out of ideas like this because it allows us to say, oh, that's not true, this idea of time that I'm living in that surrounds me. It's just an idea. It's going to come, it's going to go. You can say that about inevitability. You can say it about eternity. If you, history gives you some distance on it where you say, oh, those are ideas. Um, there are reasons why those ideas work. But they're not true, right? They're just ideas like, like other ideas. History allows you also to see where you are in certain structures. Unlike inevitability and unlike eternity, history forces you to take responsibility. Because if you, if you try to figure out what's going on around you in the past flowing into the present, you can see what you can do and what you can't do. And once you see that, then it's up to you whether you do something. And that forces you to ask the question, what can I do? And the related question, what should I do? So the reason why I wrote The Road to Unfreedom, um, The Road to Unfreedom is meant to show how to get off The Road to Unfreedom, how to exit it. The reason why I wrote The Road to Unfreedom as a history book is precisely to encourage this kind of politics of responsibility, where we accept that um, the politics of inevitability allows us to be contented sleepwalkers, and the politics of eternity allows us to be angry sleepwalkers, sleepwalkers who are having a nightmare. But the whole point is not to sleepwalk. The whole point is to be awake to what the actual possibilities are. Thanks.